Doctors of Reddit, what was the worst thing you've seen for a patient that another doctor overlooked? By Ask Reddit. Patient was lactating but not pregnant or breastfeeding. Previous doctor told her it was residual from her baby that had been weaned for 14 months. Sent her immediately for a brain scan, brain tumor. She had surgery a week later to remove it and is doing very well now. Edit. Wow, I didn't think anyone would even read this or I would have explained better, tried to sound a bit more professional. I did not do any of the follow-up care. She left my office with a referral for an MRI and a referral to an endocrinologist, who took over care. Also, please, if you are concerned about your health in any way or are not happy with your doctor, care, obtain your medical records and bring them with you to a different doctor. Don't solicit medical advice from strangers on the internet that know nothing at all about your medical history. That is very dangerous to your health. This happened to me, my daughter was 5 years old and I was still lactating. My doctors didn't listen and told me my husband was playing with my breast too much. I went to my cousin, who is a Rob, Jin, and she spoke with my doctor and he ran some test. Turns out I have a Rathke's cleft pouch on my pituitary gland. It was drained and came back. Due to other doctors not listening to me it took another 8 years for them to find out I have Addison's disease. By then I shocked everyone that I was even alive. Husband was playing with my breasts too much what? Yep. Female Drive, told me my husband was playing with my breasts too much and it was making my breast produce the milk. She wrote it in my chart. Also my period stopped, and I was told that I was going through menopause early. Mind you I was 29 at that time. That brought back a horrible memory. I had a female obgin. I asked for a refill on pain medication. I'm on the table pants down and she walks in, sits down, and says books, I think you're an addict. I don't know if your husband doesn't pay enough attention to you, or what but then she checked my c-section scar, discovered the lump of infection in there and then sighed and said okay I'll give you one refill. I know hormones had a lot to do with it but I cried for days and days. I am so sorry. I'm a young woman with a history of addiction and mental health issues. Even though I've been clean for years, I can't mention any concern I have about my health without a doctor thinking I'm looking for something. It's horrible. It is an awful, awful feeling. It is an awful feeling. Years later I had my gallbladder out and then developed sphincter of Oddi syndrome. I would rather die at home than go to the ER and have them look at me like I'm the dirt on their shoe. Because I must be de-seeking. Despite all the medical records they had from my doc all the way to IU Med. Terrible feeling. Wait, what? My youngest is almost 6. I'm still lactating and only have 3 quarters periods a year, I'm 28. My doctor told me it was normal. Looks like I'll be going back to see a different doctor to make sure. Please see another doctor about it. They should at least do some blood work on you. And if they say it's normal again, ask for a referral to an endocrinologist. I've no intention to worry you, but yes please see a different doctor. I started lactating at 19, having never been pregnant and the doctor I saw also told me I was playing with my boobs too much. I was so embarrassed. Being young and not knowing better, I just lived with it and wouldn't allow my now husband near my boobs and wouldn't even touch them in the shower. It took six years and finally trying, and failing, to start a family and having super irregular periods before a new doctor diagnosed me with hyperprolactinemia. All it would have taken that original doctor was to run a simple blood test instead of telling me to stop playing with myself and acting like I was a pervert. I am so sorry you had to go through this street the hands of a stupid doctor how are you now? Everything turned out fine once I found a doctor that wasn't a complete moron. The doctor that diagnosed my issue had no plans to treat it and pretty much had a sucks to be you attitude, so it took another year to get in with a doctor that realized there is a medication designed just to treat my condition. After I got on the correct medication I stopped spontaneously lactating, regulated my periods, ovulation, and went on to have two healthy children. I hope that you have fared well since getting your own correct diagnosis. I can't imagine how much more taxing an experience it was for you considering it was life-threatening. Jesus Christ. I'm glad you trusted yourself and saw another doctor. Me too. I am pretty insistent. Whoa. Women are told it can take years to dry up completely. That's scary. It can take years for some people, but if you've stopped lactating and spontaneously start again it's definitely important to check it out. Pituitary tumors can cause spontaneous lactation. It sounds like this patient had stopped lactating and suddenly started again, but the first doctor blew off her concerns. So uh, should I be worried? 
I've never had children but experience mild lactation, as in just a few drops every other day. Figured it is due to manual stimulation, but now I'm not so sure skeptical smiley face, my GP knows but hasn't addressed it. A friend of mine had a similar issue. It was a hormonal issue that could have done serious damage if untreated. Sadly I don't remember the details. Please get it checked out. Insist if you must, or get a second opinion. And if the doctor refuses to do anything, tell them that you need that noted in your chart. 90% of the time, they'll say, fine, and do the testing. Once when I was a medical student on surgery rotation, in trauma, we had a patient come in after he fell on the street and bonked his head. Well apparently he had fallen once earlier that day and was discharged when the trauma workup at the other hospital was negative for injuries. We examined him and noticed his eyes were kinda, yellow. So as part of our trauma workup, given that he couldn't give a great story and we couldn't be sure what happened, we CT scanned his abdomen, and saw his common bile duct was like three times normal size, could drive a truck through it. About the time, next set of vitals his temp was 103F. Guy was floridly septic from ascending cholangitis which is why he was falling down. Big miss and that is an emergency. I like how you use the word, bonked. I hope it was the same language in his medical record. There was a story pretty recently in the hospital I worked for, where a cardiologist in the ER was doing a rather difficult night shift, and started feeling light-headed, dizzy and fatigued. Given how intense those shifts are, 26 plus plus hours, sometimes multiple times a week, nobody thought much of it, and the doctor in question went to catch a quick nap in the staff room. People just passed by him in the staff room every once in a while, but they just assumed the poor guy was exhausted and let him rest. He was dead for several hours by the time someone realized something wasn't right. Not a doctor. We had someone at work die at her desk and it took almost 12 hours for someone to realize it. They thought she was sleeping and only realized something was wrong when they tried to wake her up at shift change. Anytime I see someone sleeping in a strange area in public I immediately wonder if they're dead. That's horrible. Were there other people with her the entire time? Yep. She was in a room full of people. They thought she was sleeping. Those shifts are absolute bullpoo. Poor guy indeed. Did he tell anyone he was feeling off before he went to lie down? I imagine he did, since they were able to tell what went down that night. But no clue otherwise. Absolutely ridiculous how long some hospital shifts are. They aren't healthy for the doctors and nurses and they can put patients' health at risk as well. If you go for treatment at a teaching hospital, basically any hospital with residency doctors have passed med school but haven't completed their residency, there is a decent chance you get seen by someone who hasn't slept in 24 hours and makes less money than a fast food worker, per hour worked. It's basically how resident doctors get 10 years of experience in 4 years of residency. One that comes to mind is when I was a resident, the ed doctor wanted to admit a mild septic patient with a UTI. I review her labs, and knowing that she is a diabetic, it was obvious florid DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. That kind of admission typically goes straight to the ICU to get insulin via a drip and aggressive IV fluid rehydration. She was just in the ed hallway with no medications at all looking like crap. OMG bless you. As a parent of a type 1, the hospital terrifies me, I've seen studies that say there are worse outcomes due to lack of knowledge of care. I will call the endo every hour when he's sick and spoon feed crushed ice every 3 minutes for hours to keep us home. DKA kills kids. And definitely kills young adults once they leave the care of their parents. Bless your catch and please 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 tell this story over and over. As a T1D, I've learned to fend for myself. Living with this for almost 30 years, I'm my own advocate. This doc knows what's going on, but it seems most ER docs only have basic knowledge of diabetes, and it's typically more T2D. So advocate hard for your kiddo if, when they go to the hospital, although no need to call the doc, feed ice every few minutes when they're sick. Get some ketone strips and check sugar more often than normal. Thumbs up. Young student from, I think, Pakistan. He was complaining about his neck feeling stiff. He went to a doctor some days before and he was told he was having joint pains that would pass with some common anti-inflammatory DG. When I visited him I saw many of the lymph nodes in his neck were swollen, which probably caused the stiffness, and not painful, not a good sign. Sent him right away to have a chest x-ray that showed a huge mediastinical mass, suggestive of lymphoma. Sadly I don't know what happened to him. Not as bad as that, but I had neck and shoulder pain and stiffness for about 5 years with docs telling me it was just soreness, text neck, etc. And prescribing NSAIDS and muscle relaxers. Finally a new doc said to see a rheumatologist. 
diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Doc said it is often misdiagnosed or left undiagnosed. Frustrated me for so long because I knew something was not right. Edit, for those who aren't familiar, this is a great video about living with as. If this post encourages someone to get a referral and helps to catch something earlier on, I will be super happy. As may not have a cure, but it can be managed to some degree. I found an obvious huge rectal cancer on a patient who was previously told over and over again that she had hemorrhoids sad face. I run into this a lot as a surgeon. Very few primary care providers will do a rectal exam. Just tell the patient that rectal bleeding probably hemorrhoids and give them ointment. If it doesn't resolve within a few months, I get the referral for hemorrhoid surgery and find the rectal mass. Either that, or find a colon cancer on the colonoscopy that they should have ordered months ago. Medical student here, will be doctor in May. Working an edge shift we found what was probably a missed testicular torsion. Previous doctor told patient he probably had cancer. When he showed up at our ed, what he had was probably a dead testis missed at initial presentation weeks prior. People with testes, especially young men, if you have sudden onset excruciating pain, sometimes without activity, often after, during activity, go to the ed immediately. It's one of the few things that would make a urologist lounging at home on the weekend turn on his Tesla ludicrous mode and go plaid to get to the hospital. Edit, much love to urology. Not a doctor, I had a patient show up to the ed with testicular torsion during my shift yesterday and am, had no blood flow to the affected testis. He was there for hours while we tried to get a urologist on the phone to operate on him. He was 17 and apparently some of the urologists didn't feel comfortable operating on a child. Finally towards the end of my shift we got a doctor to do the operation. I wonder if they saved it. Here's your I'm not a doctor but health tip for today if you're a dude, and you suddenly have testicle pain so severe that you're on the bathroom floor, or any floor or ground, in the fetal position, crying your eyes out and most likely throwing up from the pain, and wishing someone would just hit you with a brick to knock you out, then yeah, you need to get to the O ASAP, as you most likely have TT. Thank you for attending my testicle TED talk. MD here. Recently was called over by a nurse who told me a patient's bandages were wet as they were bleeding a little. Patient had recently had his leg amputated. We pulled his bandages off and found a spurting femoral artery, at this point the patient passed out. Patient was sent to theaters for an emergency operation. Close call for sure. Bleeding a little. Tis but a scratch. Your whole leg's gone. No it's not, it's right over there. In residency I saw a cardiologist miss a STEMI heart attack. By the time the patient came to us, some of the muscles supporting one of his heart valves had completely died and he was in cardiogenic shock, basically his heart function was so bad that it wasn't circulating the blood in his body enough to support life. It was awful. Happily he made it through though. It was obvious on ECG? It was like textbook tombstones on the ECG, no idea how it was missed. Life pro tip when seeking a second opinion, don't tell them it's a second opinion, you want a second first opinion, not a confirmation of the first opinion, I have been to multiple doctors who would not contradict the diagnosis of another doctor, even with test results that ruled out the initial diagnosis, or confirmed a contrary diagnosis. I was thinking about this reading all the other responses. The reason you get a second opinion is to get a fresh pair of eyes. If you bias them by telling them, then it's their eyes aren't fresh anymore. I suppose I have one for this as a resident doctor. We saw a kid in the eMERGE for difficulty walking. He had been slowly losing the ability to walk over months, and also had random unexplained projectile vomiting episodes. Looking at his records, he saw his doctor several times who x-rayed one hip. Then the other hip. Gave some Zofran etc. Turns out on exam he is blatantly ataxic, bad coordination, and can't even stand. Failed all our bedside neurological examinations for cerebellum function. It was obvious to me and I'm not even good at this yet. Did a CT scan. Big ass tumor in his cerebellum. It was obstructing fluid drainage in his brain too. Raising his intracranial pressure and causing the vomiting. Had to call in the neurosurgeons overnight for emergency drain and he went to ICU. Later had more surgery for the tumor. My supervisor got pretty emotional about it actually. Edit, thanks everyone. The history was that he really declined further over the last few days prompting the ed visit, so he looked really bad for us but I'm not sure what he looked like before. To any med students reading this, 1. 
do an exam. Two, it's okay to cry sometimes. Jesus, that's horrible. Was he okay, do you know? I haven't followed up yet because our children's hospital uses its own EMR and I've been at other hospitals. Just based on the scan though I think it would be hard to survive long term and he would have deficits if so. My supervisor made a comment about how he's the same age as my kid, and was visibly upset by it. Really tough situation as a resident to be in but we did our job. If it makes you feel better there are a number of non-aggressive pediatric tumors in the cerebellum that have very high event-free survival. The scans can be terrifying, but if they make it to a children's hospital and get appropriate care they can do quite well long term. I don't care if you're a koala I choose to believe you. We had a baby die in our ed due to parental neglect, as I was waiting outside the trauma bay in case I was needed, my coworker came up to me and said, that baby's the same age as my youngest. I mean, dealing with a child passing due to such an awful home life is bad enough, but his comment made me break down for a few minutes. I had a friend in college who was pre-med and did evening candy striper shifts. One day he came into our on-campus job and was just staring at a wall. I asked him what was wrong and he said, Bin, are your TVs attached to your walls? I said no, of course not. Then he told me about a two-year-old who he had watched die from crush injuries after pulling a TV down on itself. The baby was the same age as my friend's brother, that was probably 15 years ago, and I have thought about that pretty much monthly since. It got bad when my nieces and nephews were kids and I wouldn't let them touch the TVs. I wasn't even there, and it hit me hard. Yeah, I remember when my daughter was two and we had just taken down our baby gate because she could crawl up and down the stairs by herself, and you could tell she felt so accomplished every time she did. Well, not even a week later we had a two-year-old come into work who owed us to weigh due to falling down the stairs, the baby gate went back up that night and stayed up for a long time. I was pre-kids, working with ponies for pony rides at a festival when I heard a blood-curdling scream. Looked down the parking lot and there was a tiny boy under the driver's side front wheel of a jeep. Under the wheel. I ran as fast as I could to get my phone. The lady that ran the downtown improvement office said she heard me holler from a block away and she was inside the building. Once I had kids, I was hypervigilant about keeping hold of my kids' hands. Terrible tragedy. Wasn't even out with the parents, he was out with an aunt and uncle and their kids. How TF does a medical professional see difficulty walking that is deteriorating over months and not immediately seriously consider a neurological problem? Many might not understand how incredibly ridiculous this is. But this is one of the first things that should be considered. Medical school WDS out people with bad work ethics and bad memories. It doesn't necessarily WD out bad problem solvers. Damn, how do you not check the brain when a child can't walk? Crazy. The way to think of it is, not everyone needs a scan right away, although he was red flags galore, but everyone needs an exam. You would find the stuff I found on exam, and that prompts the scan, in his case TBH the thought process is that you are suspicious, your targeted exam confirms your suspicion, and you know by the time the scan is ordered. Broken neck, no really, so this one guy was brought in with an ambulance for upper airway obstruction, we diagnosed what looked like an advanced throat cancer and did a tracheostomy, after the operation, where you pull and push the neck like crazy, we checked his neck x-ray and a junior asks when did he break his neck. He had a brand new unstable neck fracture. Checking his initial x-ray we see that it was there prior to the operation, after questioning the patient he said that on his way to the hospital the ambulance was in a car crash. No one bothered mentioning it to us when he eventually came in. He only thought he had some whiplash, but he was a few millimeters away from permanent paraplegia, unfortunately he passed away about two weeks later due to the cancer. Man that's so wild, this thread is so hard to read. It's freaking scary getting told, we're not sure, but don't expect good news. I had pretty constant stomach pain last year. I'm pretty fit, active, eat fairly healthy, 26, so you know, the doctor said it was probably nothing, and gave me some acid reflux meds, which confused me because it was very much a lower abdomen pain, I was in and out of the hospital with this constant pain, man it was bringing me down. I'm usually super chipper and a happy-go-lucky kind of guy and when I started feeling, not myself, I knew it wasn't nothing. So they did a ton of blood tests and such and still didn't have an answer. I would wake up, after barely sleeping, and say, I'll have a single piece of toast, I've been eating toast my whole life, it's not that, and just feel like poo all day. Terrible, terrible stomach pain.
I remember just weeping at one point just in a total loss. Like they keep saying, nothing's wrong, we can't tell, your blood is fine. So, my doctor suggested I have a colonoscopy just to make sure it wasn't ass cancer or something, and as they were putting me under for the procedure, the attending doctor said, hey I noticed something on your blood work, we're going to take a biopsy of your upper intestine as well, but we'll have to go through your mouth. I was lights out as he said that. So they dental flossed me down the throat and up the back door, so to speak, three weeks later, it turns out I have celiac disease. After drinking beer and eating bread my whole life, it just kicked on like that one day. Glad that doc took the endo biopsy because it wasn't showing up on the blood work. My pipes and blood were just fine, but I was severely scarred from celiacs in the upper intestine and didn't even know it. It was starting to block proper nutrients from getting absorbed, so if I didn't get that I would have presented to the ER a few weeks later with scurvy, wild stuff, and honestly, best case scenario, because my treatment is just, don't eat wheat. I have to admit, already being lactose intolerant that was kind of shirty, hey, to hear, but hey, what can you do? Could have been much worse, but not fun to go through during COVID times and alone, TLDR, as I was fading from surgery DG before a colonoscopy and a doc added an extra step to the procedure and figured it out. My fiancé describes the reaction from eating even a relatively small amount of gluten as being tied to the toilet for days and emptying your body of everything possible. She went through a lot of her teens being malnourished because of undiagnosed celiacs. At least there are some good food alternatives for most things since gluten-free became a pretty popular nutrition fad. I feel for your fiancé. But that's another thing about celiacs, it's really tough to pin down because it doesn't really show up on blood panels well and the only way to get a definitive diagnosis is a biopsy. Another thing is that it impacts people differently. Like, I don't get the trots, but I feel like I have to go. You know? So I end up sitting on the toilet for hours just trying. It's not constipation either, because when I actually need to go it works fine, another thing is that it drains my energy. I don't know what it is but it just kills me. That along with the terrible bloating and cramps and pain it's just the worst, one little bite of anything gluten can spark the reaction for days, there's nothing that helps it either. My friend has celiacs too. It just hit her out of the blue in college. Apparently it can just start for no reason at any time. Isn't that just great? Ugh I feel for your friend, at least she figured it all out. And yeah, apparently is genetic. I'm one of five and no one else has problems. I drew the short straw apparently. I had the same happen to me except the back door part. Blood tests turned out nothing. GP and dietitian were out of ideas. At the hospital they ran some more blood tests, an echo and endoscopy and they concluded I had celiac disease. My nutrients were fine but I am now extremely underweight only got the diagnosis yesterday. All in all took over half a year for them to figure out I shouldn't try gaining weight by eating more bread skeptical smiley face, glad to hear you didn't have ass cancer. Hey congrats on getting it figured out. Seriously getting any lifelong diagnoses totally sucks, but hey, at least this one is self-manageable for the most part, make sure you check everything before you eat it. Have Google ready at the story and even if things say GF it's not always good enough for us celiacs. Rice, in particular, is something I've struggled with but I swear on Uncle Ben's. Good luck. Similar story. I lived in the gym when I was in my 20s, great shape, full of energy, something changed when I was around 27 or 28. I would feel worn out in the afternoon no matter how much sleep I had the night prior. I had a great diet and seldom drank alcohol. I also noticed that I would get sick if I didn't get enough sleep and my body just wouldn't heal the same way as before. It seemed like little cuts and bruises took forever to fully go away and always seemed to be inflamed. When I was 32, I broke out in a rash around my elbows and wrists. This had never happened before, but I figured I had brushed up against something while hiking. Well it happened again about a month later so I finally tried to get an appointment with my doctor to see what was up. I was in the military at the time so it took a few months to even get an appointment, then it took them three different rounds of blood work and two biopsies later to finally diagnose me with celiac disease. I have completely overhauled my diet over the last two years, damn I miss real beer, to cut out all gluten, and now feel significantly better. I have also had two upper endoscopies to make sure that my upper intestines are healing, there are definitely worse things to be diagnosed with, suffer through, but it has been a little while to see how much I changed physically just over the course of a few years. Life is crazy. 
that you're young with healthy habits so it's probably nothing thing is so wild to me. Like, no. If I was old and only ate cheeseburgers then it may not be anything other than being old and only eating cheeseburgers, although still good to do due diligence and double check, but you had no reason for random pain. People in good health don't just have pain for no reason, at least not severe and or chronic pain. That's the person you should be most suspicious something is wrong. People in good health don't just have pain for no reason, at least not severe and or chronic pain, laughs in being female seriously, if I have severe pain even remotely near my abdomen it's, is it your period? It's probably your period sweetie just take an ibuprofen and go home even if it finished two days or two weeks ago. Also, if a period causes pain bad enough that you're going to a doctor, then that's probably a effing problem that needs fixing by a doctor. Laughs in being female, this is literally the best thing I've read all day. I had a friend who got in a fender bender, but his neck was major pain. In hospital they did a series of x-rays but found no issues. As he was walking out of the department to leave, the doctor chased him down and said he wanted to do one more x-ray, from above, looking down. They found out he had two vertebrae in his neck that were essentially split down the middle. They immediately sent him to emergency surgery where he had a lot of metal installed, and then had to live with a halo screwed into his skull for a couple of months, a la Regina George at homecoming. They were about to let him walk out and go about his life with some Advil. Good on that doctor for catching that last minute. Bert Troutman, a goalkeeper, famously played on with a broken neck, which wasn't diagnosed until three days later. Ooh, I've got a good one. Albeit sad. I was working nights and a patient came in for a nail bed repair under general anesthesia, it was a slow night. As they're anesthetizing him, he aspirates so we do a chest x-ray to see if he's got any spit, blood in his lungs. What we didn't know is that prior to this emergency surgery, he'd been going to his GP for over six months complaining about chest tightness. They'd put him on various different asthma medications, but none had any effect on him. The x-ray showed a massive dark mass in his left lung. We kept him asleep and transferred him to ICU. His wife and three-year-old daughter were waiting for him on the ward. We had to tell them where he'd gone, why he'd gone there, and what was going to happen. He died from lung cancer within the month. I'm not a doctor, I'm a nurse, but not in medserg. My sister had her gallbladder out, routine surgery, and two days later woke up at 4 a.m. in searing pain, went to the ER by ambulance. I met her there. The ER docs were all apparently convinced she was a D seeker and did not even conduct a physical exam beyond taking her vitals. They snowed her to shut her up because she was just yelling, help me. Help me. I'm dying. They did eventually do an MRI but said it was negative and sent her home. She didn't want to leave, insisted something was terribly wrong, but they said they would call security and have her thrown out. At this point I'd like to mention that she had no history of D or alcohol abuse. She continued to get worse at home and the next day went to a different hospital. They did a workup and found that the metal clip that closed off the bile duct had cut right through the tissue and she had a large bile leak that was literally burning all her abdominal organs. She had to have three surgeries to fix it and was hospitalized for nine days. Left with chronic pain from adhesions and chemical burns. When the new hospital finally acquired the MRI from the original ER visit, she was told that the leak was small but clearly visible in that image. That seems like a large lawsuit. 100% this. I would be fighting those incompetent assholes. Threatening to have security throw out a patient asking for help because she thinks she is dying. And she actually is. Thank you for watching. We upload new videos every day, so be sure to come back for more fun. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed the video.